My name is Deborah Blum. I am the program chair of the World Conference of Science Journalists and the director of the Knight Science Journalism Program at MIT. My job here is to welcome you to the official start of what I think is going to be an amazing few days here at the World Conference of Science Journalists. A lot of wonderful journalists from both the United States and around the world have come together to create a really exciting program, and we're so glad to see you all here to join us for it. Uh, and with that, we're going to kick things off you know, in a dazzling way, and I'm going to ask Alan Boyle, who is one of the organizers of the conference and the president of the Council of Advancement of Science Writing, to come up and introduce our keynote speaker. Okay, thank you, Deb. Who's ready for a conference? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> uh, as Deb said, I was, I'm the president of the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing, and our nonprofit group was established back in 1960 to help organize events like this, and more generally, to improve the quality of science news coverage. And a big part of that mission is to educate science writers about the latest frontiers in research. I'm pleased to note that this is not only the first session of WCSJ, but it's also the first session of our council's 55th annual New Horizons in Science briefings. This year, we're starting things off with a bang. There are a few frontiers in science bigger than gene editing, and today you'll hear from one of the pioneers on that frontier, Jennifer Doudna one of the inventors of the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technique. Dr. Doudna is a professor of biochemistry and of molecular and cell biology at the University of California in Berkeley, which is one of our partners for this WCSJ meeting. In 2012, she and her French collaborator, Emmanuel Charpentier, were the first to propose that the DNA defense system used by bacteria could be adapted to make precise changes in the genetic code of other organisms. Since then, the system known as CRISPR-Cas9 has revolutionized genetics, but it has also sparked deep questions about the possibilities and pitfalls surrounding genetic modification. In today's talk, Dr. Doudna will share the thrilling story of her discovery and discuss the enormous responsibilities that come with the ability to rewrite the code of life. One more point. We're going to be recording some of these sessions at the World Conference, and this is the first to be recorded. So uh, if you have to step away, you might be able to catch up with every second online. So with that, I'll ask Dr. Downer to come to the stage and tell us about the code of life. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, I haven't really done anything quite like this before, so uh, it's an honor to have a chance to talk to you. I um, thought what I would do is share with you my journey that I've sort of been on over the last few years. I'm a biochemist. I've always been interested in fundamental questions about biology, and as you'll hear today, the research that we were doing in my lab is a curiosity-driven project led in a very unexpected direction that has taken us into a whole world of technology development and um, sort of all the other, all, all of the implications of that that I have found myself involved in over the last few years. It's been a really exciting ride. I'm still on that ride. And I'm really honored that all of you are here to hear a little bit about it. All of the work that you all do to write about science is incredibly important, especially now. And uh, we really uh, just want you to know that all of us uh, as scientists really appreciate the work that you do. So what I, I thought I would just uh, sort of start at the beginning and tell you that this is a story that really begins with thinking about the genetic code and, and the code of life, which as you know is DNA. It's the chemical that stores genetic information in cells. And for me, I think it really uh, is, is kind of takes me back to when I first got interested in science. So I was growing up in a small town in, called Hilo, Hilo, Hawaii, um, a rural town in Hawaii, not sort of the typical uh, touristy place you might think of uh, in Hawaii. And uh, my, my parents, nobody in my family was a scientist, but my father loved reading and he often would uh, throw uh, you know, various used books uh, my way. And one of them was the 
a book by Jim Watson called The Double Helix. And when I read this, uh, this book and read about the structure of DNA, it was an amazing kind of, I felt like a world was opening, opening up to me about how scientists could wonder about something, think, you know, gee, what is, the, what, is, what is the genetic material and what does it look like? And they could actually figure out how to do experiments to answer that question. And I was probably about 12 years old. And it really kind of drew me in to starting to think about um, things like, you know, sort of chemical questions that underlie life and eventually thinking, gee, I wonder if I could ever do that someday. And so that's really how I got, how I got started. And, um, and the other thing about thinking about the structure of DNA is I think that back in the 50s when this work was originally published, it really set the stage for modern molecular biology. It got scientists to think about things like, you know, could we really understand all of the information encoded in, G in DNA, could we, could we copy it? Could we synthesize it? Could we, could, we, uh, could we cut it, paste it, and eventually could we actually edit it? And initially, all of those ideas seemed like science fiction, and now, today, they're all reality, right? They've all come to pass. We have technologies to do all of those things, and as you know, we, have the, we even have the ability to sequence entire genomes, human genomes, quickly, cheaply, and uh, we're now mining that uh, huge store of information for what it can tell us about our own uh, futures, our health, and, and uh, how, to, how to make our lives uh, even better. So uh, for me, uh, you know, I, I think the, the question of gene editing is, is you know, it's sort of I have this uh, somewhat cheesy slide here, but you know, it's, it's really the idea that you could think about the DNA in a cell like we think about the text of, a, of an instruction manual, let's say, that tells the cell everything that it needs to do to grow and divide or become a tissue or an organism. And, and what if you could actually change that text? You could change the DNA precisely. You could erase words, sentences. You could move them around, cut and paste things or even change a single letter, a single letter in the three billion base pairs of the human genome. What if you could do that precisely and accurately? And, and this is not a new idea. It's been around for really for decades. And I can remember in the 1980s being a graduate student at a time when chemists were thinking about how to do this. And in fact, the work of Peter Durvin at Caltech, a chemist who figured out how to cut DNA at a particular place, was in fact critical for figuring out the location of a disease-causing mutation that leads to a, a neurodegenerative disease called Huntington's. And that was going on in the same building where I was a graduate student. I still remember how profound that was when the Huntington's disease gene was mapped. And little did I realize that year, you know, many years later, my own research would intersect with this field of, of gene editing. But I really got started you know, sort of in the era when this was what all of uh, us as, as biology students were taught. We were taught the central dogma of molecular biology, which is that DNA, that double, beautiful double helix on the, on the left-hand side, controls the genetic information in cells, and ultimately it encodes molecules called proteins, which are on the right-hand side, and the proteins do all of the interesting things in the cell. And then in the middle is this kind of boring intermediate molecule called RNA that is kind of a transient copy of, of the genome. It's a, a, a little uh, sort of a throwaway uh, molecule that gets made, it gets uh, utilized, it, it gets read, it's, the code is read and a protein is made, and then that RNA is discarded. And so when I was first learning about biology, I, I thought, wow, that sounds about like the most boring molecule you could imagine. And uh, then I, I went to grad school and I, I met a, a wonderful scientist, Jack Shostak at Harvard, and he was very interested in the idea that RNA actually does a lot of really interesting things biologically in its own right. And so uh, lots of, it turns out that lots of RNA molecules are made in cells that, uh, where the, their job is not to encode a protein, but where they actually play some very interesting role in their own right. And to do that, they often fold up into interesting three-dimensional shapes. And at the time, when I was starting this work uh, as a student in the 1980s, nobody knew what those three-dimensional structures of RNA might actually look like. And that's really where, what I started working on when I became, I sort of made that transition to becoming a professional scientist, was asking that question. What do, what do functional RNA molecules that, that actually do things like 
catalyze chemical reactions, what do they look like and how do they do that? How do they behave kind of like proteins even though it's a very different kind of chemical molecule? And um, so I, I spent a number of years in my, sort of my, uh, the early parts of my career asking and, and answering that question for different kinds of RNA. And in an interesting way, that sort of that line of research ultimately led me to CRISPR. And, uh, and to, to explain that, I have to point out that, that you know, CRISPR, which is now an acronym that you, know, you read about, you see it in the media, uh, most people probably don't know what it stands for, but they uh, have some idea that it has something to do with modifying DNA in some way. And, uh, and, but it's really a technology that came about through a curiosity-driven line of research. And, uh, and uh, from our, uh, our angle, it was really about understanding how bacteria fight viral infection which again sounds very different from looking at structures of, of RNA molecules perhaps, but, um, but the connection is really that uh, this, this bacterial immune system known as CRISPR is a system that operates very importantly through an RNA guided mechanism, and I'll tell you a little bit uh, shortly about how that works. Now I think the first time I heard the acronym CRISPR was from a colleague of mine at Berkeley, Jill Banfield, who is a researcher working on bacteria that grow in various environments in, the, in nature and in the most cases have never been studied by scientists. So these are bacteria that have never been isolated, never been cultivated, we don't even know what they are. And so her, the question that she likes to ask is, you know, what's out there? And the way she goes about figuring it out is by collecting samples of these microbes and then sequencing their DNA piecing it back together so that she can assemble entire genomes, and then asking, by looking at the, the DNA of these, these bugs, what they are, who their neighbors are, how, uh, what kind of uh, environmental relationships they might have, what kinds of viruses they're interacting with, and those sorts of questions. And through that line of research, she came across uh, a lot of examples of bacteria that had a very unusual DNA sequence in the chromosome of the bacterium. And this is a cartoon that shows a circular chromosome of a bacterium, the black line. And in the, in the chromosome, in many cases, these bacteria have a very repetitive DNA element. That means that there's a 30-letter sequence in the DNA that's repeated again and again, those black diamonds. And what was distinctive about that was that those repetitive elements flanked unique sequences of DNA, about the same length, 30, about 30 letters long. And so people since the late 1980s had been kind of uncovering sporadic examples of this in microbes, and nobody knew what they did, and mostly they were just ignored. But one of the things that, uh, w w the reason that Jill Banfield contacted me about this observation was that in the mid-2000s, there were several researchers that noticed that in these arrays, which had come to be called CRISPRs, there were pieces of DNA that came from viruses. And that was very interesting. It looked like a way that these bacteria were somehow acquiring DNA from the viruses they were infected by and storing a little snippet of that DNA in the CRISPR locus. And so why would they do that? And that was the question. So why would they do that? And, uh, and, and furthermore, there were CRISPR-associated, or CAS, genes that seemed to be inherited along with the CRISPR arrays. So as these bacteria were uh, replicating and growing in their environment, they would pass along not only their newly acquired viral sequences in the CRISPR array to their progeny, but also these CAS proteins. And again, nobody knew, nobody had done any experiments with these, nobody, nobody really knew what they did, they were just sort of being observed. And, um, and so Jill Banfield wondered whether these CRISPR sequences might be operating through an RNA intermediate, a little transient copy of those sequences that would be made at the level of RNA that would somehow allow cells to use that information to find and maybe to destroy the same viruses that they had been infected by in the past. So it's sort of an immune, an adaptive immune system, but in bacteria. And so she contacted me because of, she knew about our research on RNA and our sort of ongoing interest in the, in sort of the myriad functions of RNA and biology, and that's really how uh, we got drawn in to working on this, um, starting in around 2007. And, uh, and so this uh, system, which uh, 
really operates as an adaptive immune system allows cells that are infected by a virus to protect themselves from future infection. And the way it works is that a cell, so right, what I'm showing you here is a, a virus landing on the surface of a bacterial cell. It's literally like harpooning the cell and it's injecting its DNA at very high pressure into the cell and leading to an infection. And in, in bacteria, when this kind of viral infection occurs, the cell only has about 20 minutes to defend itself against the virus before it gets destroyed by the virus. And so that's a very strong selective pressure for cells to come up with ways to protect themselves. And one of them that had escaped anyone's notice until, until uh, you know, around the mid-2000s was, was this CRISPR system. And so way, the way the CRISPR system operates is it uh, uses a uh, mechanism of detecting this injected DNA and grabbing a little piece to integrate into the CRISPR array. And that's what I'm showing you here in this uh, cartoon is that uh, these, these cells, I'm showing you a sort of a corner of a bacterial cell. It's got a couple of viruses that are infecting the cell and injecting DNA. And if this cell has a CRISPR array, it's able to integrate a little piece of the viral DNA sequence into its own genome in the, at the CRISPR locus, saving it for future use. And to use that sequence, it makes a copy of the, of the DNA molecule in the form of RNA. It's made initially as a long piece of RNA. You can see it's got these little lollipop-like handles on it. Those are structures that the CRISPR system proteins can recognize and, re and, and use those to break apart this long piece of DNA into shorter units, each including one sequence that comes from a virus. And those little bits of RNA, called CRISPR RNAs, assemble with the Cas proteins to form protein RNA complexes, little machines that can now go looking through the cell, searching for DNA or occasionally for RNA that has a letter sequence matching the sequence in the CRISPR RNA. And if a match is found, that DNA or RNA is recognized as foreign, the system grabs onto it, and the Cas proteins are able to cut it apart and lead to its destruction. So it's a really nice way that bacteria can adapt and acquire immunity to, uh, to viruses. So over the years, we've actually in the lab been, you know, we're, we're biochemists and structural biologists, so you know, we love to get in and look at the molecular machinery of something like this and figure out how it works. And we're sort of always ask, asking the question, how? How does that work? How does it do that? And so we've worked on all the aspects of these CRISPR pathways, but the the aspect that I want to talk to you about now is, is really focused on this last step, the interference step of the pathway, because it was really through our work with Emmanuel Charpentier to understand how these systems operate to detect and destroy foreign DNA that led to our understanding of the CRISPR system and its harnessing as uh, how it could be harnessed as a, as a gene editing technology. So, uh, so when I uh, started working on these CRISPR pathways, we were initially focused on uh, some of the systems that, there, so there are many sort of flavors of these in biology, many different types. And we were working on one uh, set of CRISPR pathways. And then I went to a conference in 2011 and I met another scientist, Emmanuelle Charpentier. And she and I didn't know each other. We had read each other's publications in the scientific literature, but we had never met. And when we got together, uh, she said uh, to me that she was working on a different kind of CRISPR system than I had been studying in my own lab. And she had a, had a question about, about it that they weren't able to answer in her lab. And that was really, a, it was a, one of these how questions. How does it work? And so we got together to figure out the molecular function of the central protein that plays a role and its, and its RNAs in this pathway, which is a protein called Cas9. And so in the course of that collaboration, we figured out that the Cas9 protein, which is the blue uh, sort of blobby structure in this cartoon, is a fascinating enzyme. It's a, it's a molecular scalpel. It's a little machine that can cut DNA, and it cuts it at places that are dictated by the CRISPR RNA that it's holding onto. And this protein is literally a programmable protein. Just like you might program your computer to do something, the cell can program this protein chemically using RNA to direct it to a particular sequence of DNA in the cell. 
And so what you, what you see in this cartoon is the blue Cas9 protein holding on to a DNA molecule. So remember that DNA is a double helix, right? So there's two, two strands of DNA. And the place in the DNA that this protein grabs onto is a place that matches the, DNA, the, the letter sequence in the CRISPR RNA, an RNA that would come from a CRISPR locus in that bacterium that has stored a little piece of a virus in the, in the, in the CRISPR array. And so that, when a match occurs, the RNA and the DNA can base pair with each other, A's with, with, uh, with T's and G's with C's, and the um, DNA opens up, and that allows the protein to cut both strands of the DNA. So it leads to a precise double-stranded break in the DNA at a place that is dictated by the CRISPR RNA that it's holding onto. Now, one of the things that was really uh, really interesting about this line of research was that, uh, you know, and this happens in, in science, is that, you know, we discovered some things that we absolutely couldn't have anticipated and predicted. And one of those things was that this protein in nature is guided not just by one RNA, but by two, two separate RNA molecules, the CRISPR RNA and a second RNA, which is the red one there, called tracer. And the tracer RNA is important not as a, a directly for guiding the protein to a particular sequence, but instead for forming a structure with the CRISPR molecule that allows the Cas9 protein to grab onto it. So you have to have those two RNAs and the Cas9 protein to form this kind of a complex, this little sentinel that can look through the cell to find DNA sequences that need to be cut. And so it was through doing that kind of biochemical dissection of this and figuring out how it worked and what, what was necessary for targeted DNA cutting that Martin Jinek, who was a postdoctoral scholar in my lab at the time working on this project, recognized that he could simplify the system compared to what nature has done. And his idea was that he could actually link together these two separate RNAs to form a single RNA molecule that would have both the targeting information and the Cas9 protein binding information in the same molecule to form a, a targeting complex like this. And he did, you know, he had this idea and, you know, we talked about it in, in, in the lab and said, oh, this would be really cool if this worked. And so he generated a bunch of guide RNAs that were designed in this fashion but with different targeting sequences on the end and had a, you know, sort of really uh, one of the probably most fun experiments we've ever done in my lab, which was, you know, showing that he could actually program this protein to cut any desired DNA sequence using that kind of a strategy. And for us, this was kind of the proverbial moment when this project went from a curiosity-driven research effort to recognizing that this was going to be a very important and very powerful technology, because here we had a protein that could be trivially programmed to cut DNA and generate the kinds of breaks that would be repaired in plant and animal cells that would lead to gene editing events. So it's sort of the classic example of you know, doing, doing research that's aimed at answering one uh, type of question and then realizing that it was, this line of research was intersecting in a really exciting way with a whole lot of uh, science that was going on in many other labs, but not in our own, um, that had come to appreciate that in plant and animal cells, if the genome, which is a, you're seeing a segment of DNA on the top of the slide, if a double-stranded break occurs in those kinds of cells, rather than it leading to degradation of the DNA, which would just lead to cell death, cells have a sophisticated machinery for detecting those double-stranded breaks and fixing them. And those breaks can be fixed by a couple of different processes that e lead either to a small disruption in the DNA sequence during the repair process or by integrating a new piece of DNA that actually leads to incorporating new genetic information at the site of the double-stranded break. So many labs had been studying this process and, and again over sort of a couple of decades had come up with a series of technologies that would allow targeted breaks to be introduced into genomes. The challenge was all of those approaches to generating double-stranded breaks in, in, in cells were cumbersome to use. They were, they were, you know, they were complicated. They were expensive and you had to be an expert. And so many labs, although looking at that technology and saying, wow, I'd really like to be able to use that in my lab, they couldn't actually do it because it was just 
it was too hard, too expensive, and it took too long. And so the thing about Cas9 when it came along is that it sort of came along, it's a technology that just came along at kind of the, the perfect time in a way, because there was a huge pent up demand for a way in which scientists could make very targeted changes to the DNA in cells and organisms, taking advantage of all of the genomic sequencing data that was available, more of it available every single day, um, better and better understanding of what the content of genomes really is, what, what, do, what do genes do, and understanding mutations that cause genetic diseases, for example, and then the frustration at not being able to do anything about it. You can see they're there, you can see the mutations there, but you can't, you can't actually change it, you can't fix it. And this technology came along at a moment when there was demand for this, and also it provided a relatively simple and inexpensive uh, way to make those kinds of targeted changes that could be widely adopted in labs across the globe without, with very minimal sort of input in terms of either cost or, or expertise. So let me show you a, a, a video that just um, sort of summarizes uh, what, I, what I mentioned, what I sort of told you about the way that these, these uh, bacterial immune systems work, and I, it might not be playing automatically. You might have to start it uh, on the screen there, if you don't mind. So we're looking at uh, uh, bacteria that are growing in some environmental setting, and uh, hopefully the video is going to play. Are you able to play it? Yay or no? If not, we'll just we'll move on, and I can show it. Anyone who wants to see it, you come to my website later. You can have a look at it. Um, it looks like he's not getting it playing. So come, come to my website later. You can, you can check this out. Um, but I'll show you, let me show you this. So this is a, this is a, a, a three-dimensional uh, printed version of the actual enzyme that does, that sort of initiates DNA uh, gene editing. And what you're looking at here is, and this is actually based on real data. So it's based on X-ray crystallographic structural data that show us what this Cas9 molecule looks like when it's holding on to DNA. And so the protein is the molecule in white. It's got a guide RNA in orange that it's holding on to, and that's, that's the sequence of letters that tells it where to go, which DNA molecule or which part of the DNA it's going to grab onto. When it finds a matching set of letters in the DNA, it grabs onto the DNA helix, pulls it apart, and then leads to a cut. And I'm not going to show you the, all, of, all, of the, all of the data for this, but we have a lot of information. We've been working in my own lab and in, in many others as well on this system for the last several years. And we know now that this is a very dynamic little machine. It literally is a protein that has a lot of motion to it that's part of its mechanism. It searches, grabs onto DNA, opens it up, and then cuts. And we, we, we know that this uh, machine, we can take advantage of some of the mechanistic work that we're doing to make the machine even better, more accurate, faster, um, and have properties that are going to be uh, useful in various, for various uh, applications. And so we think that, you know, it's, I, I think it's, you know, it's been really exciting to see how one can do both fundamental research and sort of curiosity-driven science, but then see how that knowledge will help advance uh, technologies in important ways as well. So I wanted to show you one more video, and hopefully this one will actually work. Um, it should play, yeah. So this is um, imagining what, it, what happens in an animal or a plant cell when this protein with its guiding RNA are introduced into the cell. So of course, in these cells, the DNA is inside the nucleus, so we're zooming into the nucleus. And furthermore, the DNA is wrapped around proteins called histones, so you can see it wrapped up, it's sort of packaged in the nucleus. And this protein, Cas9, with its guide RNA, has to search through all of that DNA to find a sequence that matches the sequence of the guide RNA. And when that occurs, it unwinds the DNA, makes a cut, cuts both strands, and then releases it, releases the broken DNA so that it can be detected in the cell and repaired. And in this example, repaired uh, uh, in, which involves integration of a new piece of DNA. And the amazing thing is that this protein with its guide RNA is effective at doing that kind of chemistry in every type of cell where it's been tested. Human cells, fungi, pigs, mosquitoes, uh, you know, any, sort of anything you can imagine, right? Zebrafish. And, and it's, it's been just an incredible 
thing to watch this technology take off over the last five years as labs around the world have adopted it for all sorts of applications. And so what happened first was that you know, people started using it for research purposes as a tool where they could tickle a gene over here in the genome and look at what effect that would have on the, on the organism. And, um, and, and there's, of course, lots and lots of that uh, type of research going on right now in many uh, different kinds of systems. But increasingly, people are able to start adapting this for real world applications. Things like, you know, thinking about how we might actually cure a genetic disease, not, not just treat it, but, but actually cure it, correct it at the level of DNA in a patient. How we might be able to make crops that are genetically altered in such a way that they don't have random changes in the, in the genome, the way traditional plant breeding is done, but they have a very targeted change that leads to an ability to uh, deal with drought or fight off uh, pests without using chemicals, you know, things like that. The way we could use this to control the spread of mosquito-borne diseases by, uh, again, at the genetic level, creating mosquitoes that aren't capable genetically of spreading disease. So there's lots of really, you know, really exciting opportunities, I think, with this technology. And, uh, and so what's happened is that, you know, this is a, a slide I put together that just, you know, kind of uh, shows you in one snapshot, many examples of the kinds of organisms that have been modified using the CRISPR technology. And so what's happened is that it's really opened up organisms for study that in the past were simply not genetically tractable. They were organisms that you know, just couldn't, couldn't be investigated at the level of genes because we just didn't have the tools to do it. And so now you know, we, have, uh, we have a tool that works uh, sort of you know, agnostically in any, any organism. So a scientist who feels like studying uh, the African killifish, for example, like Anne Brunet at Stanford, uh, can suddenly do that, not just by observing natural mutations in killifish, but she can actually go in and make very targeted changes in the genome and investigate things like, you know, how, do, how is this fish able to, uh, it has, a, has quite a short lifespan, how is it able to, to survive in a very stressful environment, and what can that tell us about perhaps our own genomes and what, you know, interesting uh, genes might be similar to a fish like that that could tell us something about longevity. Um, so I thought I would just show you, I, I have to show you one data slide, I hope you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, one of the things that, that has been exciting for me is that, again, I, you know, I started off my scientific career as a biochemist, and we've always done very fundamental research in my lab, but we can't help but be excited about the opportunities of using gene editing to treat disease. And so in partnership with clinicians at UCSF, We've been now working on a strategy for delivering gene editing molecules into the brain. And this is an experiment done by a postdoc in my lab, Brett Stahl, in which he was able to chemically modify the Cas9 protein to make it able to get across cell membranes, something that the protein doesn't naturally do. And by, chem but by chemically altering it, we can get this protein to get into cells efficiently. And so by doing that, we can actually introduce it into the brains of mice and have a look at how, it's, how efficient it is at editing uh, the neurons in the brain. And to, to be able to visualize this, we're using a strain of mice that has a red uh, protein that's encoded in the genome that can only be made if gene editing occurs at a particular place. And so we can monitor editing, and you can see in this slice through, a, through a, a mouse brain that's been edited in this way, you can see a lot of the tissue, a lot of the cells actually turn red. So we know we're getting high levels of editing in the tissue that surrounds the sites where we're introducing this protein. And we're actually using this now to, um, uh, we have two different models of Huntington's disease in the lab that we're working with. First time I've ever had mouse protocols in my lab, sort of amazing, working with mice. And uh, we're hoping that we can actually get this to the point where we see therapeutic benefit in animals that can then be, uh, sort of take us on the path towards clinical trials in humans, something that we would do with our clinical partners at UCSF. A couple of other uh, applications of this that, that I want to mention. So um, I actually think that when I think about the applications of gene editing and where it's going to have the biggest global impact, at least in the near term, I think it's going to be in agriculture, actually. 
And uh, this is an example that I, that I sort of love because it, uh, well, I love to grow tomatoes for one thing, but, um, but th this, this, uh, this was a publication that came out in the journal Cell over the summer from a scientist at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, Zach Lipman, who was able to use the CRISPR technology to generate plant, uh, tomato plants that are capable of bearing about two to three times more fruit than the, the, their sort of parent uh, strain. Why is that? Well, because he was able to figure out that genetically that he could make a very precise change to the genome that allowed these, uh, the branches that hold the fruit to, to be much stronger. And it was a, a change that, for genetic reasons, really was almost impossible to do by traditional genetic uh, uh, sort of plant breeding methods. And, and even if you had, it would have taken many years to, to do it because you would have to, because of all the sort of, you know, back crossing and sort of uh, uh, outbreeding that you would have to do in these plants rather than just making a very precise targeted change and growing up the plants. So um, he, I think this, you know, was exciting and, you know, it was on the cover of Cell partly because, you know, a lot of people like to grow tomatoes, um, but also because it, it kind of, I think, emblemizes how this will be used in the future. It's going to be used not just by the, the Monsantos and, and Dow DuPonts of the world that want to make changes to big crop plants, but also by, by uh, you know, backyard farmers who are going to want to make changes to plants that are growing in a local environment to make them better adapted to that, to that environmental setting. So I think this is a really exciting development. Um, I also wanted to point out that uh, we've had some news this week about, about pigs. So there was, a, there was a, first there were, there were CRISPR pigs that were, uh, were announced uh, not too long ago for the purpose of organ donation. So these were pigs that were engineered using, using the CRISPR system to remove endogenous viruses, viruses that were part of the uh, genomes of natural pigs that could potentially be transmitted to humans if you, you were to use their organs. And so by, cre by removing all of those viruses, you could create kind of clean organs that could, in principle, be used in the future for, for organ donation. But this week, it was uh, CRISPR bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody see the CRISPR bacon? <laughs> so uh, really, really using the, the CRISPR technology to, to create leaner pigs that um, maybe, maybe their bacon is healthier. I don't know. Um, and then I, I, I want to I sort of just sort of, I'm almost done here, but I want to I just point out that uh, there's, a, there's a fundamental difference in, in, uh, in the type of editing that can be done in cells that are already mature, we call those somatic cells, versus cells that are, uh, that are going to be able to, to transmit their, their genetic changes to future generations, and we call those cells the germline, right? eggs, sperm, embryos. And, um, and so actually very early on in the, in the development of the CRISPR technology, there was uh, appreciation that using, using uh, gene editing, and CRISPR in particular, was very effective in the germline. Here's a, here's a great example, a very visual example, uh, that was given to me by uh, Sunata Kodka, a student at MD Anderson Medical Center, and she, um, she told me that she was doing experiments with frog embryos and had these beautiful visual results, so she sent me the slides. And in this experiment, what she did was to take two cell embryos, so that there's a, literally a line down the center, two cells in the, in the embryo, she injected the CRISPR molecules into one of the two cells in such a way that she disrupted a gene that encodes the brown uh, color of the animal and replaced it with a gene that encodes a green fluorescent protein. And so what you can see is that every resulting uh, two-cell embryo has one green cell and one unedited uh, normal cell. And when these animals uh, grow up, they grow into tadpoles, you can see that right down the center of the animal, uh, if you look at the top animal, only one eye is brown, the other one is not, it's missing that pigment. And if we put the animal under a fluorescent light, you can see that all of the cells on the other half of the body are green, right? So they've all received that, that genetic change. So it really sort of demonstrates the, the potential of using germline editing. And, and it didn't take very long for scientists to start doing this in mammals and eventually in non-human primates. And this, uh, was a monkey that was actually edited and reported on in early 2014. And for me, this really was kind of the moment when I realized that I needed to get out of my lab and start talking about the potential and the impact of gene editing and the CRISPR technology, what it was going to mean for the future, 
and to try to encourage a, a, a kind of a collective voice among scientists that would, uh, would encourage responsible use of such a powerful tool. Because of course the question was, what about doing this in human embryos? And if you think about it, this is a technology that could be used to change DNA in human embryos that would lead to heritable changes in all future humans that that uh, embryo might grow up and, and reproduce and, and generate. And, and so it really gives humans for the first time a tool that allows us to control our own evolution. We can rewrite the code of life in human cells and make heritable changes in a targeted fashion. And, and, and uh, we know now, from, again, from work that's been published really just in the last couple of months, that this actually can work uh, quite efficiently in human embryos. So the, we know the tool works. The big question is really, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to use it in that fashion? And if we are, uh, uh, how are we going to control that? How, we, how do we regulate it? Who decides who gets to use it and for what purpose? And who pays for it? How do we make sure it doesn't lead to even larger inequities in, in society? Um, are CRISPR babies right around the corner? I, I really don't think so, because I think in most cases the, uh, you know, the kinds of, of changes to the, to the DNA that you would need to make to, to introduce these kinds of you know, enhancements are, are, are just either unknown or there are too many genes that would need to be altered to be effective. But nonetheless, we know that that, 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 that day is coming increasingly when it, it will be possible to do the, the kind of editing that would lead to um, you know, to, uh, to someone being able to decide what kinds of traits do they want their, their children to have and to do that kind of uh, alteration in the laboratory. So I've been involved in, uh, over the last few years in, in, in really encouraging a responsible discussion of this. You might know that earlier this year the National Academies of Science and, and Medicine here in the U.S. in collaboration with National Academies in China and the U.K. put out this publication which is a hefty sort of 80 page read but they have a nice executive summary and, um, and it's really just a, a, a very thoughtful review of where the science is today, where it's going in the future, and how we can try to encourage a, an active uh, participation of people, not just scientists, in deciding how to use uh, this powerful technology. And uh, I want to just close by mentioning that uh, uh, I, I ended up writing a book about all of this, this experience and sort of what it's been like. Uh, from the science side and then thinking about the, the ethics of this and going forward with a very talented former student of mine, Sam Sternberg, and Sam really gets the lion's share of the credit for this book. So if you're interested in this topic, uh, that's one place you could go for some information. And I want to just mention that I've also been involved in founding an institute at UC Berkeley and UCSF. It's a cross-bay uh, partnership. We're doing a lot of science in the institute, but we're also in, uh, really involved in science education. And I encourage any of you that are looking for information about the CRISPR technology and want to learn more to uh, come to our website or, or even come, come visit us either at, at Mission Bay, UCSF, or over at Berkeley if you're, if you're uh, here and, and want to come. And uh, with that, I'd like to just thank you for your attention. And I think we might still have some time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dahmer. Uh, we do have uh, probably 10 to 15 minutes for questions, and we have a couple of mics set up, and so we're going to be pretty firm about having people come to the mics and asking questions. Uh, with that, we'll take the first question. Were you, check, check, were you freaked out when you realized the potential of what you had helped rot? Like, what was your personal reaction well, to it? Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I once told a, a New Yorker reporter, Michael Spector, about a dream I had, um, and I was kind of mortified when it showed up in his article, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what reporters do, right? But um, yeah, but I, I you know, I, I, uh, I, I was pretty freaked out, actually, and I, I that, in that dream, I dream, I had a dream that it was very, one of these sort of nightmare type dreams where a colleague of mine was, uh, walked me into a room and wanted me to talk about the CRISPR technology with a friend uh, who turned out to be Hitler. And, um, and you know, in sort of the, in the dream, it was the shock of realizing that, you know, what happens if a powerful technology gets into the wrong hands? 
and you know, many, many scientists over millennia have, of course, faced this kind of a challenge. But I kind of, it was a bit of a shock to realize that I was suddenly kind of in that situation and that I, I wouldn't feel good about myself if I didn't um, get out of the lab and, and really start talking about it openly and encouraging responsible behavior. Is there some promiscuity to the system depending on how long your oligomer is that directs the CRISPR? And are there calculations that would tell you how to, how to make it as specific as possible, essentially one in a hundred million mistakes or things like that? And the second thing is if you get double strand cuts just by having a single um, complementarity, does that um, have implications in that you can target either strand and you get the double cuts, and would that also have implications for tumor treatment in that double strand breaks are harder to repair than otherwise? Yeah, so, um, so the first question about accuracy, there's been lots and lots of, of work done on this and lots written about it. Um, it's clearly very, very important for any kind of clinical use for sure. Um, what's been learned so far is that the, the system naturally is, is pretty good. It's, it's, uh, it, you know, it's uh, certainly for research use, it's, I, th I would say it's, it's good enough. Uh, it's not that easy to find off-target edits that occur, especially with the ways that people have learned to, you know, sort of control the amounts of the protein that are in cells and things like that. But um, it's also been possible to engineer the protein, actually, not the RNA, to be an, a more accurate enzyme. And I won't go into the mechanism of that, but we actually understand uh, how, to, how to make it more accurate. So I think that's, I currently don't really see that myself as a bottleneck to future use, even in the clinic. I think it's gonna be possible for it to be accurate enough for those kinds of uses. And then with respect to the way that DNA is cut, whether you make a double-stranded break or, or two single-stranded breaks, um, again, lots of, lots of uh, investigations ongoing about what's the best way to uh, generate um, you know, targets for DNA repair in the cell that lead to the desired outcome. And I frankly think that's currently one of the real forefronts of the field, is figuring out how to control DNA repair. We know how to do the, make the breaks now very well and how to, how, to, how to control that, but we don't know yet how to really control the way the DNA repair happens, and that's sort of the next forefront, I would say. Thanks. Uh, you talked about some remarkable applications, but I'd like to ask you about the potential for a few more. Uh, could CRISPR, for example, contribute to a new generation of antibiotics? Could it prove useful in uh, cellular engineering to uh, potentially uh, address uh, a challenge like climate change through uh, algae or something like that? I'd just like to hear some of those applications, if they have any potential in your view. Yeah, no, I think those are both very exciting directions for sure. And, and interestingly, both are kind of still at the beginning stages. I think what was fascinating to me is that, that you know, there was a, an initial jump into human systems, right? Human cells and human cell engineering. And only later, people kind of realizing, hey, we could actually use this in microbes, where it came from, and we could use it to control microbes, maybe as an antibiotic, uh, or maybe as a way just to kind of regulate what we call the microbiome in people, right? So there's now both academic and, 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 and commercial groups that are working on exactly that. And then with respect to something like biofuels, yeah, lots of excitement about how we can use gene editing for synthetic biology applications, where you can use it to engineer pathways from, you know, in, from one organism into another very easily. People like Jay Kiesling across the Bay doing a lot of that, but you know, of course many others. And, uh, and I think the potential there is also really exciting, yeah. I, I bet that you could talk about ethics for months, but um, for people like us, what are some of the primary ethical issues you think we should be aware of? I think there really are three big ones. There, there, you know, th things always come up, but I think the three big ones that, that, that I hear the most about and that when I give talks to sort of more public lectures always seem to come up, one is, as I mentioned, sort of human embryo and human germline editing, that's a big one. But also um, use in agriculture, 
and the whole, all the challenges around GMOs and what do, we what do we define as a GMO? Different countries define it differently and this is now really challenging, I would say, different countries to revisit their regulatory frameworks and ask, you know, are we going to are we going to regulate CRISPR modified plants and products or not? And how do we think about that? What do we th what about CRISPR animals? You know, and so it's really challenging people to have to think about that again. Um, and then the third area, which I didn't specific, uh, explicitly mention, but I think is an important one, is something called gene drive, which is a way of using a gene editing technology like this that that works very efficiently to drive a genetic trait quickly through a population. So there are now a number of groups, philanthropic groups, that are supporting this kind of work in mosquitoes with the idea of controlling the spread of disease by making genetic modifi modifications to whole populations of mosquitoes. That sounds really great, but there's also the potential for something like that to get out of control. So again, you know, a challenge there, do we think about, you know, how do we think about uh, public health and, and, the, and the need there versus um, protecting the environment. Are there any holes in current understanding of how the CRISPR repeats function in bacteria, for example, how um, they kind of acquire the little bits of the viral DNA and put them into the bacterial genome? Yeah, so I didn't uh, have a chance to tell you about that today, but there's actually a lot understood about the mechanism of that process. Not everything is known, but, but we, do, we know a lot about the machinery. So there's a, a special protein called the CRISPR integrase that is the, you know, the actual machinery that grabs those viral sequences and inserts them in the genome and does it accurately every time and that sort of thing. Um, and, um, you know, and I think, I think some of the other fundamental aspects of these pathways are still very much under investigation. And in fact, we know there's lots of different variations on that theme in, in nature. So I think, you know, for the fundamental uh, biologists that are working on that, there's a lot to keep them busy for, for probably quite a while. I was wondering if there are any particular um, writers or researchers in ethics who you've looked to for answers, especially um, about altering human genetics? Oh, probably too many to name, actually. I mean, there's so, so many. I, I've had the good fortune to really uh, meet a lot of very thoughtful thinkers and writers who are, you know, have been doing this for much, much longer than me and are much more deeply knowledgeable about all the sort of the ins and outs of, of uh, ethical issues around new technologies, especially thinking about how new technologies are viewed across the world. Because, of course, in different cultures, you know, people think about these things very differently. And I think that's it's absolutely fascinating. If you, um, if you Google, you know, CRISPR and ethics, you'll come up with a long laundry list of, of things that, you know, would be a, maybe a place to start. Um, you've mentioned, uh, you know, there's a lot to think about as far as ethics is concerned. Uh, you mentioned inequality, uh, potential for gene drive getting out of control. I was just wondering if you personally have ever thought about what the kind of worst case scenario is for uh, this kind of Pandora's box that we've unlocked now. I think at least in the short term, my worst case scenario is that somebody somewhere uh, does something with CRISPR that um, is perceived, you know, maybe really is dangerous or at least is perceived as dangerous or irresponsible that leads to a big public backlash. So for example, let's say that tomorrow a CRISPR baby were to be announced. Um, how, how would that be received in, in the current climate of, of the United States? You know, I, I, I can't predict, but I, I, I might worry that, you know, that this would lead to some kind of a backlash that would cause a lot of people to call their government representatives and say, you know, what is this CRISPR? You need to shut that down, right? And I think this could really be a, a, a big problem because, you know, I think for, for those of us that are in the trenches with the science, we, we appreciate that, that this is a, you know, for the most part, this is a wonderful technology, right? I mean, it's gonna solve a lot of problems and we wanna be able to move as quickly as we can towards applying it in those ways. And so I would just hate to see something happen that would, would cause that kind of, um, of you know, of, of disruption. And, and this, is, this happens, right? I mean, for example, you know, there's lots of examples, but one is, one is in the whole field of gene therapy, right? And so the, I, you, know, the, you may know that you know, um, in the early days of gene therapy where viruses were being used to modify human genomes and, and human patients, 
that a patient, just Jesse Gelsinger, actually died, right? He had, you know, it induced a cancer in him. And because of that death, it really, you know, shut down the whole field of gene therapy for at least a decade. Nobody even worked on it. It was kind of a bad word. You know, if you mentioned it at a scientific meeting, people just wanted to run the other way. So I, I think that's, you know, in the short term at least, that's what I, what I worry about the most. I, uh, I've been told that the room uh, Sierra G for Gene is not that big. And so I, with your permission, we'll just continue the questioning here and uh, pretend that this is a press briefing. And uh, when you have to go, you have to go. OK, so sure. Let's, let's just keep it going here. OK, thanks, Jennifer. Um, interested to drill a little bit further into the question around regulation and whether we define the organisms that have been shaped using CRISPR-Cas9 as GMOs, as you know, it's a very lively conversation. And in fact, today in Australia, our, our technology, gene technology regulator has issued some draft um, conclusions from a technical review of our current act. And scientists have been, uh, you know, it's a very kind of anxious conversation behind the scenes. And what they're wanting to do is to have uh, organisms that have had CRISPR applied to them, if a gene has been inserted from a, an equivalent species, don't regulate it as a GMO, don't call it a GMO. It looks like the regulator is going to call that a GMO, and the only thing they won't call a GMO is those that haven't had a gene inserted. So I'm just interested in how you see those distinctions in a regulatory t way, because that's happening all around the world right now, that very conversation. Yeah, well that's very interesting. I didn't know about this latest work in Australia. So you may know that in the United States that it's very similar um, sort of the way that, that GMOs are defined in the U.S. So if, an, if a, um, a plant product has been modified with a gene editing tool or any kind of, any kind of tool that uh, makes a, a change to the DNA that doesn't result in, in, in putting in any foreign DNA, right, just mm -hmm. makes a little disruption to the DNA, but doesn't put foreign DNA in, it's not considered a GMO in the U.S. But if I take that same plant product and I go over to Europe, suddenly it's a GMO. Why? Because in Europe, they define the plant product according to how it was, how it was produced. So if it was produced using a, a gene editing technology, it doesn't matter what the change was, that, that resulting product is considered GMO, right? So, so um, you know, my own opinion about this is that I guess I, I largely agree with the, with the US, uh, you know, regulations right now. I think that, you know, it's hard to argue that you know, if something, something has a, a genetic disruption that doesn't introduce any foreign DNA, to me, it's sort of hard to argue that that's really been, um, I mean, I guess you could say, yeah, it's genetically modified, but it certainly doesn't have any, anything that's uh, sort of uh, unnatural in the, in the genome that's come from outside, right? And um, whereas if, a, if a, you know, a new gene is inserted in some way, then, you know, that's a much bigger uh, kind of change. I think that over time it's going to be necessary to, to, to really grapple with the, you know, some of the scientific details of this, right, and figure out, you know, when you have a, I think for lots of things where you have a foreign gene inserted, I think it, they're perfectly safe, frankly. Um, but for many people, you know, it's kind of getting down in the weeds of, you know, trying to understand the science and then figure out, you know, what do I consider to be safe or not. And oddly enough, you know, people are in much more, at least in my experience, much more receptive to making changes like that, even to the human germline, than they would be to making changes to their food. Before we take the next question, you've been standing for an hour. Do you want me to get you a chair? No, I'm okay. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. I'm okay. And a, or a bottle of water? <laughs> no, I'm okay. okay. Thanks. All right. So yeah. on we go. <laughs> um, CRISPR is obviously very exciting and has been getting a lot of attention. And I wonder if there is any aspect that in all of that attention, you found people report consistently incorrectly or overhype. So I guess, is there any aspect of the reporting that gets on your nerves? <laughs> <laughs> Tell it. <laughs> we can take it. Um, actually, I feel like, honestly, I, I, and I'm not just saying this because you're all reporters, but I think the reporting has largely been quite, quite good. And I think it's partly because a lot of the reporters writing about it um, you know, they, 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 they've, you know, they do their homework, right? They take their time to, to try to learn about the science and understand what's going on. Occasionally, you know, I'll see a, I'll, not so much now, but especially early on, there were some, a lot of CRISPR baby kinds of 
articles that made it sound like uh, you know a, a CRISPR baby is going to be born any day, and then it's, they're going to take over the world and things like that. Um, that was sort of you know pretty out there. But um, I think for the most part, it's uh, the reporting has been um, really quite good. I guess the one thing I almost hate to bring it up, but I will anyway. Um, is that I think that you know for me as a scientist I love the science and I'm excited about the opportunities with this I, I get kind of discouraged sometimes when I see a lot of focus on the patent fight uh, and, which is sort of a negative aspect of all of this and, and, and not something that you know I, I think any of us are, are proud of to, to have going on between our universities so you know that that kind of gets me um, down a little bit when I see a lot of focus on that rather than focus on the, you know, the, the really exciting aspects of the technology and where it's going. But. Can you comment a little bit on your experience as a woman in science and also were there any daily ha habits or activities that sort of set you on the path of success just in your personal life? Well, uh, very generally, I would say that you know I feel very I feel very fortunate and very grateful that I've had a lot of great mentors along the way, men and women, who have encouraged me at various times in my career. I, um, I th when I think back on it, I you know I can think of many, but certainly several major uh, moments when I when I had doubts about myself and doubts about my decision to be a scientist. Um, you know, we all face challenges in our, in our professional lives and in our personal lives. And, you know, I've just had the good fortune to, to at those sort of moments of doubt, I somehow always came uh, in, in, in contact with somebody who said, no, no, keep going. You know, you're, you're on the right track. You trust yourself. You know, keep, keep going. And um, so I'm grateful for that. I, I think that for women especially, and I, I've seen this now, I've been running my academic lab almost 25 years. And so I've, you know, I've seen a lot of students come through and postdocs over those years. And I think that, in, that you know, if I had to, I hate to generalize, but if I had to, I, I would say that I do see more of a tendency for women to doubt themselves in science and, and to, uh, to say, well, maybe I'm not good enough. You know, I just had somebody in my office yesterday, actually, uh, uh, who was saying, well, maybe I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'm quite good enough to apply for an academic job. I, you know, maybe, I, maybe I'm not good enough to run a lab myself. And, you know, and I, I'm much, I feel like I'm more likely to see that Kind of, kind of doubt in, in women than men. So I always try to encourage women, especially to you know, um, you know, go for it. You know, take take a risk. It's going to work out. You know, trust yourself and and uh, look for people who are positive uh, mentors and 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 who can give you uh, good support as you go forward. I think that's true for men too. But I think maybe women need sometimes that even a little bit more. I'm from Pakistan. I wrote an article about a bat found in the thick forest of Islamabad. The bat relies on mosquito and uh, uh, it, it eats 300 mosquitoes in one hour, three to 400. The bat is a very good pollinator of hundreds of plants and uh, flower plants, which are rare. So are we rushing towards, if we wipe out the mosquito, it affects the bat and affects badly on the rainforest and the rich flora as well. This is my first question, if you use the CRISPR technology in a broader sense. My second question is, why we are rushing towards to use it to the human? Why don't we, uh, we use CRISPR technology to, uh, in, the, in the computational biology, as we see in protein folding, and we wait for more science to, uh, to, uh, to assess that whether it is fine for us or not? Yeah. These, these are the two. Yeah, so maybe I'll just go, I'll answer your second question first. You know, why, why, are, why is there seemingly this rush towards using it in clinical medicine, I think you were asking. And um, I, I think it's just that, you know, it's, it's a, such a tantalizing opportunity to think that you could actually treat genetic disease at the source. And this would be a type of therapy that, in principle, could be one and done, right? You would give one treatment. And, and you wouldn't have to treat the patient ever again because you would have cured their disease at a genetic level. So I think there's something incredibly tantalizing about that. And you know, there are many diseases, sickle cell disease, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, and you know, I could go on and on, that have very well known single gene causes that at least in principle now would be curable or at least um, treatable by, you know, but, but in principle curable by this, this kind of strategy. So I think it's just such a tantalizing opportunity. And the tool is frankly 
you know, good enough that, uh, you know, you can show that you can have that kind of curative effect in animal models. So, you know, I think that makes many people think that there's a, a huge opportunity there and they want to see that come to fruition. Um, but for sure, I mean, you know, uh, there continues to be, of course, a lot of in parallel fundamental research on the system and testing it in other systems and, you know, trying to figure out how to make it even better and, and all of that. So that's all going on in parallel. Um, and then your, your first question, I didn't, I didn't fully understand what you were asking, but I, I think you, you're asking me something about uh, using this in, 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 were you saying in plants and in the... Mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Right, yeah. So he's asking about, you know, if we use gene drives to wipe out mosquitoes, that's a problem in, in, because they are food for bats and other animals. So, yeah, that's for sure. And so I think, I think the, the implementations of gene drives that I see discussed that I think are, 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 are in a way a, a better approach is the idea of using a gene driver or a certain method like that not to wipe out mosquitoes, but actually just to make them incapable of transmitting disease. Um, a lot of the things that you said about the potential of gene editing, such as curing diseases, synthetic biology, dealing with climate change, they were all said before with gene therapy and gene modification. Is there a danger that um, there's a bit too much hype at the moment? Clearly we as reporters have got to take some responsibility for that, but is, uh, are people in your field perhaps getting a little too excited with, dare I say it, one eye on funding? Yeah, I always, I always, uh, you know, I'm always cautious about that because you, you're right that you don't want to, you don't want to overpromise something and then have it not really come to fruition. And we have all seen that happen for, for various, you know, discoveries and technologies that, that have come along. Um, but I think that my own feeling is that I, I don't think it's been really overhyped, for the most part, uh, in the media that I've seen. Because I think the thing to appreciate is that this, this technology really is, you know, it, it really is transformative, right? It's really changed the way that, that many scientists are, are operating in terms of the way they do science, even the kinds of problems they can pick to work on. Um, None of us know right now, I would say, how soon, you know, will this actually be effective as a therapy, right? I mean, we just can't predict. We don't know because clinical trials haven't started for, for any genetic diseases yet. And you just never know if, you know, something is going to come up that turns out to be a, you know, a, a showstopper, toxicity or, you know, who knows, right? Something could happen. But, um, but I think uh, right now, at least, the, you know, the technology itself is, is clearly at a level where it could be deployed in that fashion if some of the downstream kinds of things can be dealt with, like delivery and you know, specificity, you know, all those, those sorts of things. And, and those are all uh, aspects of the technology that are very actively being, being studied. So I think for now, it's, I, think it's, I think the level of, of discussion about CRISPR is about right. And just to follow up, if I may, did your colleagues work in gene therapy and stem cell research say, similar kind of things about those being transformative technologies? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I guess the difference is that, you know, this uh, is, you know, it's sort of, um, it's really a technology that just reaches across so many different aspects of biological research. So, you know, in, with stem cells or, you know, certain things that, you know, cancer immunotherapy, and these are clearly absolutely transformative, but they're, they're, they're really, um, you know, they're working in one sort of area of biology. Whereas when you have a, a, just a very generalizable technology like this that's working at the, I mean, it's everybody from people studying Neanderthals to, you know, people that are clinical, you know, doctors trying to cure disease to, you know, somebody that's working on rice to somebody that's studying uh, how to make uh, biofuels. You know, it's all of those people are all using the same tool fundamentally, right? And so they're all being impacted by this. So that's, that's just kind of the difference is that it just, it really is a cross-cutting kind of technology. Um, a double question about ethics, uh, maybe a tricky one. First, uh, can you imagine any experiments that you would be ready not to do in your lab because of the possible ethical consequences for society? And a related question, it's tricky also, depending on the answer to the first one, uh, is ethics outsourceable 
in this kind of topics about we're talking about redefining genetically what is you know human human life through modification of germ lives and so is ethics outsourceable a scientist can a scientist merely outsource the ethical discussion to the public or politicians or should a scientist try to incorporate the um, fears, ethical fears of the population at large in their own ethical perspective? Well, I, just again, to, so to take the second question first, I, I think that I think scientists have to incorporate ethical thinking into their into their work. And I, I, I didn't, and again, this is, I'm sort of on this interesting path because earlier in my career, I never thought about those questions, you know? Being a biochemist, I never thought about, you know, when I sat down to do an experiment myself or to talk to a student about doing an experiment, I never thought to myself, gee, is this an ethical thing to be doing? I, I just, it didn't, never crossed my mind, right? Because we, you know, we were just doing very fundamental kinds of, kinds of, uh, kinds of research. But now, you know, I think when you think about uh, doing something that, where the outcome could have real you know, implications to, to society, sort of at a societal level, uh, whether it's public perception all the way to the actual thing that you might be generating in the lab that could be problematic. You know, I, think, I think one has to ask those questions. And um, for me, myself, I mean, the research that we're doing is, you know, we're, not, we're certainly not working on the human germline, for example. We're not doing anything with embryos. We're not working on mosquito you know, gene drives. We're not working on any of these things. But, I still, you know, like with the mouse experiments that we're doing, you know, it starts to, you start to ask yourself, you know, and there's, you know, people that have very strong feelings about should animals be used in research, and, you know, this was never something I thought about personally before, but now I have to, right, because that is something that we're doing in the lab. So, so um, I just think that, you know, I've started to tell my students that I think that, you know, any time you have work that's going on in your lab in particular that you're doing that is, uh, you know, has implications beyond the, you know, beyond sort of the immediate uh, academic field that you're working in, if you're an academic scientist, then, uh, you know, you really have to be thinking about those questions. I don't think that could be outsourced. Uh, on that first question, are there some things that people have thought about that you just say, no, no way, that should not be done with CRISPR? Well, I just don't think that uh, I don't think that 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 CRISPR should be used right now clinically in human embryos. Um, you know, I, I just don't think that that would be a responsible thing to do. And and why is that? Well, because I you know for one thing, I just don't think that uh, we we have had a time as a as a society to grapple with the implications of something that you know gives uh, power to you know control uh, the human. Uh, the human genome that way, and and uh, will we ever? I, I don't know, but certainly we're not there right now. So I think that would not be a responsible use of the technology. Um, but believe me, I don't think everybody shares that point of view, and I would not be at all surprised if in the next couple of years we saw announcement of the first uh, CRISPR modified uh, child somewhere in the world. So. Okay, I think we've got about three more questions. Uh, so. Go ahead and we'll wrap it up. Could I bring you back to the use of CRISPR and gene drives in conservation and pest control, as the mosquito is being an example? You may be aware of New Zealand's plans to eradicate all introduced mammals by 2050. At the moment, that's done largely by poisoning, trapping, killing, and other methods. But of course, gene drives are discussed as a method that would actually make it possible by 2050. That would mean eradicating not just one species, but multiple species. What would you, your comments be on that? Could you, I, I had a trouble hearing that uh, question. Yeah. Can uh, I, I'm sorry. Um, would you like I, me to summarize? Or? Sure. So New Zealand has a plan to eradicate all introduced mammals, rats, stoats, mice, by 2050. At the moment, that's being done by trapping, poisoning, sort of manual traditional methods, but gene drives would of course be a, you know, a method that could be added. I'm just curious to hear your comments on not just eradicating one pest like mosquitoes, but multiple pests. Multiple pests. Yeah, Pet, or predators or pred pests, yeah. yeah. Introduced. Well, like I've, heard, I've heard about um, work that's, I don't know how far along it is, but people talking about, you know, could you use a gene drive to control ticks, you know, to control the spread of Lyme disease, for example. And at Berkeley, we've been talking with some of our 
uh, forestry colleagues about, you know, could you use a gene drive to deal with the bark beetle that's uh, destroying arboreal forests in many parts of northern, the northern America, uh, con northern uh, continent. And um, um, I think it remains to be seen, quite frankly, how well those are really going to work in an environmental setting. And right now what's happening is there's some very good, and we're not doing any of this ourselves, but you know, there's some very good scientists that are working on uh, testing gene drives in different systems, mostly either fruit flies or, 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 or mosquitoes mm -hmm. in enclosures that allow you, know, you to sort of you know, manipulate the environment in an enclosed area and see how the gene drive operates in, a, in that setting, which is not quite the laboratory, but it's also not the, you know, the open environment either. So I, I think the jury's out. It's not clear yet how well those are actually going to work in that, in that kind of a setting. I still think it's very important to be uh, quite cautious, frankly, about releasing organisms that have the potential to spread a trait very quickly without um, you know, a lot of careful investigation and, and, and controls. Okay, I'm afraid we're down to the last two questions, and this gentleman had a question. Hi, um, you mentioned your, your Hitler dream, um, and it makes me wonder how you feel about like, the technical feasibility of, say, like a bad actor um, using this technology uh, for some sort of like, biological warfare or other um, kind of yeah. bad well, outcome. I, I've had a lot of discussions uh, about that, you know, uh, do we worry, how much do we worry about bad actors using this? And, and I think that, you know, my own feeling is that I guess I don't worry about this particular technology any more than I worry about lots of other ways that bad actors could uh, be, um, you know, d doing bad things, right? And, you know, th there's already, I don't know if you remember, some years ago there was uh, um, this, situ this case where a scientist had uh, had submitted to a journal an article that described in detail how to synthesize the smallpox virus and, you know, how to do it by, you know, just piecing together DNA that you could buy from a commercial vendor. And um, there was kind of an outcry over this, and the journal ended up holding up the publication, and there was lots of debate about, you know, should this be allowed to be published or not? And in the end, it was because the argument was, well, but that, you know, that information is kind of out there anyway, and you know, it's, it's not like somebody who really was determined to do this couldn't, couldn't figure it out. So I think there's lots of, you know, there's lots of um, you know, ways that people can uh, do bad things. And, and, uh, but I do think that it's, you know, it, it really is critical for scientists to be engaging in that conversation. I don't think it's responsible for somebody like me to say, well, I want to get back and do the next experiment in my lab, and um, I'll let other people worry about the, you know, the ethical challenges or the you know, potential misuse of a technology. I think scientists have to be part of that conversation. And this is the last question. Um, so, sorry to be one of those journalists that you don't like because uh, they focus too much on the patent issue. <laughs> but and sorry to be the last one. Uh, I would just like for you for for you to to tell us a little bit. How do you think that affects the job, your job, and the job of of scientists? The fact that there's so much money at stake, that there is this war, that you know will have consequences that will be important. I, I'm sure it has to affect. Uh, day-to-day -day research, and if you can tell us a little bit how. Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, again, I'm on a really steep learning curve with all of this, because, you know, the whole world of patenting and, and, you know, commercialization of science was largely unknown to me before CRISPR came along, because I, you know, the type of work that I did wasn't anything that, for the most part, I, I wrote one patent when I used to work at Yale, and, you know, it, uh, uh, it got licensed to a company, and every year I got a check for a thousand dollars of royalties. And it's like, oh, that's nice. I can, you know, uh, <laughs> use it for my Christmas vacation or something like that. But um, yeah, it's you know, I think that that it, for me, it's really caused me to reflect a lot on um, how sort of the, the bigger question of how do we think about uh, protecting ideas and technologies so that they can be, on the one hand commercialized and that companies will be incentivized to, and investors you know, to, to, to commercialize things. And, and frankly, to do, do science that wouldn't be done in academic labs, either because you know, academics can't afford to do it or we just don't have the wherewithal to, to, to do it. 
versus um, ensuring that you know we have open exchange of ideas and you know things that we really cherish in science. I mean, I, I sort of, I, I a little bit lament the days uh, being sort of gone when you know I and my students could just blithely you know tell anybody we wanted to about anything that we were doing and not have to worry about gee have I filed a disclosure on that or you know have I public you know have I have I already published that work can I talk about it. Um, but you know, a part of it's just kind of I have to grow up, right? I mean, it's it's part of you know it's just part of the, the the real world now. I think that's you know that's sort of the world that we're in, and you know, and when I'm too old to do anything else, uh, I keep thinking that you know it'd be really interesting to go back and kind of look at that whole history of of uh, patenting and how it's done in different countries, and and really think uh, at, at a at a higher level about whether there is a, a different way that this you know could be done because. I certainly don't think that you know spending tens of millions of dollars on lawyers is a good use of money that could be used to further development of a technology that you know I think we'd all like to see it used to solve real problems. I'd li like to see that money going towards the science, uh, not into uh, lawyers' pockets. But. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Great way to kick off the conference. So, Thanks, thank all you. Of you.